Hello, Korea. Good afternoon. I guess everyone is a little bit busy munching. Eh? Um, so yeah, um, my name is Faiz. I'm the CFO for Luxtech. Um, I think Jeff already explained a little bit about what we do, but you guys are interested to know more about Luxtech, feel free to come out booth at the back um, of this hall over here. Um, so today's talk will be about provenance. Um, how we describe provenance is quite simple. It's basically a history of something, of a product, of an item, of a title, maybe a property. And the idea of provenance has been around for a while, predates way back before blockchain. Um, art especially has a very uh, interesting long history of provenance. If you have a history of buying an art, uh, have any experience of buying an art, some very well-known arts usually have like a, lot, a huge thick file uh, talking about the history of this particular piece of art. Um, where does it come from, the origin of it, um, where was it displayed. And the reason to this is because with provenance comes a better appreciation of the art and of course a better valuation of that particular piece of product. Um, and today's discussion is a very important use case of blockchain. And I, I'm sincerely thinking that you guys don't want to miss this. Um, so while you guys are munching a bit, uh, feel free to uh, hope you guys can give uh, good attention to our great uh, panelists here today. Uh, so before we start, I'd like to ask our panelists to introduce themselves, uh, starting with Alex. Hey. Hello, everyone. My name is Alex Shenerman. I am VP of Engineering at uh, Exonum at Bitfury Group. Uh, Bitfury Group established in 2011. Uh, we are a full service blockchain company. We have two departments, hardware, de hardware department that develops ASICs for mining and uh, another department uh, deal deals only with software. Uh, we are about uh, 500 employees uh, worldwide. We have presence in 17 countries. In Bitfury software department, we have around 110 employees. Uh, our core uh, development team located in Western Europe, in uh, Ukraine, and uh, we developed three products. First one is open source framework for private blockchain. The name of the framework is Exonum. Uh, it's open source, so everyone can download it from GitHub, can play with it on his own. Uh, the second pro product is Lightning Pitch. It's a, a wallet that's built on top of a Lightning network. And uh, we have wallet application. We have uh, application for uh, Lightning uh, Pitch Hub. Uh, and also we have an, a dashboard uh, for uh, POS terminals uh, for providers of uh, uh, micropayments. And uh, the last product is a monitoring tool for fetching suspicious transaction on Bitcoin blockchain. The name of the product is Crystal. Hey guys. My name is Mike Sullivan. I'm the founder and CEO of Real Estate Chain. First, I want to say congratulations on that win last night. I got to watch it near Gangnam Station and the energy was incredible and I was just very grateful to be here for that. So you have a new Korean soccer fan. <laughs> um, so I'm um, co-founder, CEO of Real Estate Chain, background in real estate data and content, uh, based in Boston where I also organize a cryptocurrency and blockchain meetup. Uh, real Estate Chain is building an international standard uh, and the biggest global database for real estate information. That's things like photography, floor plans and schematics, property data, demographic data, parcels, things like that. So the information layer. Uh, we're focusing on new development properties initially and we're testing and launching in three locations, the United States, Peru and either Korea or Hong Kong. So the information layer for real estate and incentivizing the contributors to, of the data to, uh, to upload and uh, contribute high quality and reputable information on the real estate chain network. Hey, 안녕하세요. 저는 프로피의 노홍균이라고 합니다. Um, welcome, nice to meet you guys all in the audience. My name is No Hong Kyun. You can call me Hong. I'm from a company called Proppy, which deals with 
uh, title deeds and where uh, cross-border real estate uh, buy and purchase uh, platform on the internet based on the Ethereum blockchain. And what we do is we, have, we cover a broad variety of use cases for the Ethereum blockchain on the real estate market, ranging from just simply buying and selling to auctions and building tokenizations. So one of the reasons why I'm here for provenance is because of we're dealing with title deeds that is the essential of buying and selling or just auctions for real estate. So we're gonna talk about that. And oh, I forgot, I'm the uh, official representative for Proppy in Korea and also the, the community manager in Telegram. So if you want to talk to me later, if you can't reach me in this forum, you can just reach me at the Proppy official Telegram group. And also our app is already online on iOS and Android and you could just go into proppy.com the platform itself is already online with uh, 150,000 listings worldwide. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, so let's go with the first question. I think a very basic question about provenance, right? The idea of provenance has been around even, like, like I mentioned, even before blockchain exists. So um, what are the benefits that blockchain offers um, to the current provenance use case um, that we've seen? Um, maybe Alex wants to start? Uh, okay, uh, I think uh, blockchain uh, uh, supposed to um, solve uh, um, the main problems that we are targeting is uh, trust and transparency. Uh, so everywhere where uh, is a problem with trust, for instance, between society and government, we can come with uh, solutions based on blockchain. Uh, and uh, another um, main thing uh, and where we're aiming to uh, solve the problem, we would like to cut so-called middlemen. So where, where we can cut fees, etc. there we can uh, come and uh, um, propose uh, solutions based on blockchain. And actually in uh, Bitfury, we have uh, two successful use cases. One is a uh, use case of uh, um, land titling in Republic of Georgia. Uh, about one year ago, uh, we put all regist land registry of uh, Georgia on our uh, exonum framework. And actually, uh, right now, uh, everyone, er every owner of uh, um, a piece of land uh, can get an information uh, about, about uh, his land registry, about history of this land registry, etc. And another successful use case uh, that's related to provenance is actually a use case of uh, supply chains that we, um, uh, we made with uh, Arisent. Arisent is a huge company with headquarters in San Francisco. Uh, it has uh, around uh, 12 a thousand employees around the world. There was a problem with subcontractors and uh, suppliers. There was a total mess with uh, um, uh, task definitions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we made the systems based on our open source framework, Exonum, that right now there is a very clear and very transparent, you can get an information, subscriber can get an information about uh, any task that approve or at, uh, that assigned to him, and uh, you can get an information about the uh, status of this task. Yeah, yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, Maybe you might like to add in to the benefits of blockchain? Sure. Uh, for Providence, benefits of blockchain, uh, I think uh, a chain of ownership that's transparent and um, you know, can be tracked from the beginning to all the different actors who are involved in having some kind of item is, uh, is extremely valuable. It incentivizes good behavior uh, and um, has a lot of other benefits. Uh, in this space for chain of ownership and everything, better? I'm interested in uh, non-fungible tokens. So I think that there's a behavior that we're seeing where things that have properties of physical collectible items. So things like, you know, Pokemon cards or 
whatever uh, a, a trend is that has value because it's unique and it's scarce. There's limited supply of them, and uh, you know they have certain desirable features. I think um, there's a trend where that's uh, moving over to blockchain, and it's proven through you know silly projects. I shouldn't say silly, good projects like CryptoKitties that uh, people recognize scarcity, uniqueness, and uh, proper chain of transfer on the blockchain. So there's an, uh, where things where there's an owner, and that owner can approve other people, kind of like renting it or allowing access to different objects, information, uh, collectibles, um, and anything really. I think um, we're moving into uh, more real world applications too. So it started as, CryptoKitties, Digital Collectibles, Decentraland, uh, which is an uh, another great project and another good use of Providence too. Um, but I'd like to see it, uh, and I think it is moving towards uh, more types of real world applicable collectibles and things where uh, people can have ownership and access different things. Okay, um, since we, uh, maybe Hong would like to add Yeah, can I add up? Yeah. yeah just like uh, Mike said about middleman and I think that we have a mutual understanding as a Korean we all went through all sorts of active X's and Kongi Ning Jin Seo like it's like a province you have to go through when you purchase e-commerce items in Korea you have to go all through those steps and you have to install vaccines or free 3 and labs and so what a uh, provenance based of blockchain could do is cut all those, not just for real life commodities, you cut out all those unnecessary processes just to verify who you are and what you're buying is true. And for us, for Propia and also I think for Alex, for real estates, uh, we had a brief talk backstage about this. What uh, blockchain could bring us for provenance is that in the real world, Maybe many doesn't know, but one third of the world population doesn't have the way to prove that the patch of land or house is theirs. Uh, the property rights aren't provable. Uh, so it doesn't really sound palpable for the first, first world countries like US or for Korea. And even for Korea, we don't have a fully digitized real estate trans transfer system. So what uh, the blockchain for provenance could do is cut all those middlemen and we don't really have to go through the process of trust because we, just, we could just uh, provide the title deed based on, for example, for us, for Ethereum blockchain and just um, install nodes for ev uh, each uh, different countries if they want to have our system on the back end. And for example, for Haiti, when they had a big a disaster uh, through because of the earthquake back back in what was it 2000 early 2010s uh, the, actually they had a big fire that really broke up the title deed registry and they didn't have any further proof of property rights so they had an ongoing problem about that and we could also talk about Venezuela when they had a failure in the government system so they couldn't really prove about the property rights. So through blockchain, we could cut on all those uh, problems, middlemen in a unified system for the greater good, not just for the billionaires that could purchase uh, houses in Paris, but all for the whole general public. Okay, um, since uh, even might have added a little bit about regarding uh, some interesting use cases about uh, blockchain provenance or blockchain use case. Um, in the context of provenance, right? Uh, maybe, if you, you, do you guys want to add a bit about um, which specific industry do you see um, where um, the benefit of blockchain provenance is the, more, uh, the most relevant? And what are the challenges that you see, uh, maybe in the context of the industry that you're in and the industry of, you can say, you can see potential use case of it? Um, Anyone would like to start? Um, sure, I'll go. Um, I like food, so I think that's a good one. Uh, you know, a way to track that the 
vegetables you're eating, the meat you're consuming, everything like that to the source. I think that's a really interesting application. It holds people along that supply chain accountable. And I'm obviously biased being, you know, the co-founder of Real Estate Chain, but I think real estate is, has uh, many, many uh, uh, benefits when it comes to Providence. Um, our, one of our newest uh, team members, and he's uh, on the executive team, was formerly uh, president of all of Remax Holdings, uh, Jeff Lewis, and he described uh, the holy grail of all of real estate to be attribution, uh, meaning how do you, in a real estate transaction, how do you get things down to the point where the appropriate people are compensated uh, in a thoughtful, meaningful way, some of which can be automated. So, you know, real estate agent A is involved in the process and so is real estate agent B, maybe not equally. Uh, this person contributed the photos, this person contributed uh, the, this kind of information, this developer contributed this. So, uh, the what, what it comes down to in order to get to that kind of future where we have a, a more uh, fair real estate system is that the information has to be uh, tracked, uh, incentivized to be good and truthful, and um, we're trying to attack that information layer. Um, you know, there's other applications with real estate too. These guys, Proppy, they're attacking titles and deeds, which is a whole different amazing animal and a great application too. Hong, would you like to add into that? Or? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, just like Mike said, we're, we may be a bit biased for real estate in this issue. And tackling about title deeds, I want to emphasize on what the hardships of title, um, attacking, oh no, just challenging provenance is that we're relatively free from the issues from like scalability issues or blockchain itself. Because we're on Ethereum network, we're not gonna have like 5,000 transactions per second as for a real estate platform. But the real problem for us is uh, actually educating the government, um, government bodies and the actual legislators. For example, in the US, we're constantly trying to educate the real estate agents and the legislators and the senators. And we recently had a talk in the Senate of California uh, educating about provenance or title deeds and for property itself, how we could benefit US as, for example, on the 2008 crisis, uh, the financial crisis actually started from a bit of moral immoral act actions, but the housing systems. So we're trying to educate uh, those legislators and what I, I think that's about it what I have to say yeah, okay. uh, yeah. I can add. Uh, actually uh, all challenges with scalability and the uh, performance uh, when we're talking about blockchain uh, we are solving with our private blockchain framework exonum written in rust language is uh, pretty new uh, I think it's about eight years old. The language that um, actually is there, um, it founded by Mozilla Foundation. It's it very fast and very secure. So our private blockchain, we can support up to 3,000 transactions per second. And because it's private, there's no uh, issues of scalability. But the challenges uh, that I can see uh, with digital transformation of existing business to blockchain is uh, first of all how to transfer all existing data to blockchain and uh, another challenge is um, how to persist the data and how to secure the data uh, this is a very important thing uh, because even on private blockchain there is an issues uh, related to security that we need to think how to encrypt the data uh, even uh, uh, that in uh, uh, Exanum we're using uh, elliptic uh, 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 cryptography of elliptic curve uh, but uh, beside that we need to encrypt all data that we will store on blockchain and there's another methodologies 
uh, that we are using, I can talk about it uh, a little bit later. Uh, also, the main challenge of uh, transferring to blockchain, uh, there is how you migrate data from one blockchain to another. Because probably some business already integrated uh, some blockchain and they would like to move to another blockchain. So that's an issue. It's an open question. Yeah. Okay. Um, also, just to add in into the discussion as well, uh, especially since Smite was talking about food, um, one of the big challenges, especially looking at provenance per se of food, for example, is that um, market incentives of different players are, are not always in line with transparency. Uh, there, for example, of course, us as consumers would be very interested to know where does our food comes from, um, whether it's ethically sourced, whether it's organic. Uh, those are basic questions that we as consumers would have. But of course, um, especially if you imagine it in the perspective of you see, the producers, right? First, they need to go the hassle of entering this information, making it available and transparent. Um, then, if, for example, these are not in line, maybe they're not uh, producing organic food, they use a lot of chemicals, and this information is publicly available to all their consumers, so it's not within their market incentives uh, to actually make this uh, a, a public, to make this a public disclosure. So, a selective disclosure is something that, that, that would actually happen. It kind of skews the market in terms of that transparency that we're talking about, right? Um, so, uh, in terms of uh, use cases, right, um, how do you think that um, we can apply in the context of how do we increase or improve the market incentives of different players to use blockchain uh, as a form of uh, provenance for different kind of products, even property, for example? Because perhaps there are people in the players who doesn't want to disclose certain information about their property. How, how would you go about with that? Um, Maybe Mike would like to start? Sure. That's a loaded question. <laughs> uh, so it's been echoed a couple times throughout the conference, but everything comes down to use. And are people going to use it? Is it simple? Is it a better solution than what they're used to and everything like that? And in this too, that's the most important. So one of the, uh, the big issues when it comes to the, the topic of providence and you, is you have to have a clear, clear value propositions for all the actors on the network, uh, including the people contributing at the source. So why would the farmer want to get on board with the system? Um, you know, is it, is it, um, are you going to be giving them more leads? Is there, is there going to be higher demand? Um, can you clearly demonstrate that? And all of the other actors too, uh, they all have to be aligned and on board. And Alex mentioned the data and stuff too. So there's going to be questions and do I want to migrate to such a system where things can't be changed? It's very transparent. If I make a mistake, you know, that could come back to haunt me. So you have to, uh, you know, it has to be solid and uh, the different participants have to know that it adds very clear value to them and it's not going to backfire. Maybe Alex would like yeah. to add. Uh, I, I can add the, from the technical point of view. Uh, actually, you don't need to put all data on blockchain. You can put it on some distributed database, you can secure it, and you can put in, into blockchain only cryptography hash of the data. That's it. So, uh, and uh, when you will check the hash, uh, you can compare it to hash in the database, and uh, when you see it is uh, uh, not equal to the hash into a database, there is an evidence or there is a proof that something bad happened with your data. So, but you can put your encrypted data into a database without any problem and use a blockchain only for storage of, of hashes. Yeah, yeah that's a definitely good clarification mm -hmm. to make and thank you. Uh, there's, you know, the mis misconception that everything is on a public blockchain is, is open and transparent, but uh, most of it shouldn't be. But uh, that message has to be delivered clearly. Uh, absolutely. Uh, also, another approach, uh, you can put all data on private blockchain, and you can use public blockchain only for proof. What I mean, for instance, Exonum provide a service called anchoring. So at the end of the day, 
you, you can, they, you can put a hash of entire private blockchain network into a public blockchain. And because I mentioned that Bitfury is full uh, service blockchain company and they have mining farms around the world. So we, we can uh, provide the warranty is that your transaction will be mined and, and, and they will, uh, we will put it on a public blockchain. So you will have uh, proofs of, or evidence of uh, state of your network on public blockchain. That's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, maybe Hong like that. Yeah, I want to add about the privacy issues and what the sensitive data and public and private blockchain does is, uh, for example, for us, even though we use the Ethereum blockchain for private on no, the public blockchain, so everybody could see how the transactions are going, how many transacts, transactions per second on our platform is happening. But for sensitive data for like privacy or the nationality of the buyer and seller, we actually are using, as uh, Alex said, uh, proprietary encryption solutions. And for identity issues, we're joining with a Civic by Vin and Lingham for identity issues or Uport. Or currently in development, we're uh, trying the ERC-725 protocol on the Ethereum network. So what I'm trying to say is we don't have, like I uh, said, so we don't have to ha use just strictly one pu public blockchain and jeopardize the privacy part of the, uh, the aspect of the blockchain. So that could be solved by integrating several other blockchains together, like uh, Mike and Alex said. And that, will, that won't be much of an issue in the near future, in my opinion. Just to bring back the conversation a bit, right? Um, so privacy is one, I would say, one of the main concerns when it comes to blockchain provenance. Uh, reason being is because you have an immutable data that could be publicly seen by anyone who has access to those blockchain. Um, you can imagine, especially going in line with certain data protection act, you have the rights to be forgotten, rights for erasure. And when you have emotive data on the blockchain, um, then, then that's a huge um, conflict in terms of regulation versus um, data, data per se, right? Um, this is really important for, in, let's say in the cases of property or in the cases of art. Uh, you do probably don't want to like, everyone in the, in, uh, to be able to know that you have 20 properties uh, publicly. And, and one of the, you see, the, you see, the uh, solution we've seen and discussed here was uh, actually using uh, private blockchain. To, um, and from that private blockchain, you anchor it to a public blockchain to ensure that there's, a, um, there's no form of tampering in this private blockchain. So all information is stored on you can see, a private database, but there's a way to prove that this private database is actually tamper-proof. Um, am I getting this right? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, also, um, maybe, um, what are other concerns do you think that will exist when it comes to blockchain provenance, uh, in, especially in terms of tech? Uh, maybe Alex would like to add to that. Um, do you think there are any other new concerns? Uh, could you repeat the question, please? Uh, yeah. uh, is there any more further concerns when it comes to tech? We have concerns in terms of privacy, uh, concerns of scalability. Do you think, is, is there any other concern when we're talking about blockchain provenance? Um, okay, we discussed a uh, performance issue and we, di we discussed uh, a security issue, but uh, uh, um, the another issue can be uh, for, for, for the business doing, again, digital transformation to blockchain, uh, can be a technology background of uh, developers. Because, uh, for instance, uh, right now, as I said before, Exonum developed in uh, Rust uh, language. So to work with Exonum, uh, you, the, uh, the best approach uh, is to, uh, to have uh, some uh, team of Rust developers that will uh, easily integrate platforms that developed in Rust language into Exonum. But here we come uh, uh, with a solution of bindings. So we have uh, Java binding, actually it has been released about uh, two weeks ago. Uh, so wh what's it mean? It means that we provide all services of, of Exonum in, the, uh, in Java. So you don't need to uh, encourage your developers to learn new programming language. 
you, you can um, just ask from your Java developers to starting write smart contracts in Java and use Exonum as is. Also, uh, we know that an, an issue with another programming languages like C++ and Python, so we are working on uh, C and C++ binding. It will be released in three or four months. Uh, that actually, yeah. Okay. Um, thanks, Alex. Uh, maybe Mike seems like to want to add in in terms of like why do you see um, current challenges? I mean, what do you see limitations that blockchain would have? Or uh, yeah, one additional uh, challenge right now. Uh, you mentioned ERC-725 tokens. Uh, we're doing uh, ERC-721s for uh, you know, the non-fungible part of it. Uh, and this means that these unique uh, assets are built on top of the Ethereum network. And uh, this is expensive, so gas is a problem. Um, and it, it's great to test, it's great to develop, it's great to create the, uh, the formulas and protocols. But once there's volume, uh, and velocity on the network. Uh, a lot of projects who are developing these types of technologies are you know, thinking about how they're gonna be able to shift to something else so that the gas won't accumulate, it won't be very expensive in use. Uh, so people are looking to develop similar standards to ERC-721 on platforms like NEO or EOS, or uh, maybe not use a, a proof of, of work algorithm, maybe proof of authority or, you know, some kind of proof of stake or something like that mm -hmm. to uh, mitigate costs. Do want, okay, I, I have a quick note. Okay. So uh, we're using, a, inside of Exonum, we're using consensus algorithm, it's BFT algorithm. It's very secured. Uh, and uh, also regarding um, a fees of Ethereum or Bitcoin blockchain, here uh, actually uh, the the, the place to use private blockchains. So you can uh, actually, uh, you can uh, um, just put all transaction on private blockchain. And if you need to put a proof or an evidence on public blockchain, you can do it at the end of the day or once a week, something like that. So that's the way to go, I think. Maybe Hong would like to add in yeah. for you as well? I just want to add about the business aspect of using public or private blockchains or trouble, troubles of using our privacies. So, for example, let's talk about SKCNC, a Korean, Korean enterprise, which also holds in the SK group, the SK Telecom. So if we're talking about SK Telecom, the chairman or chairwoman, oh, uh, Ms. O, oh, said like using the blockchain or the Ethereum network or the self-developed uh, network on the SK Telecom channel because it's based on internet, it's an IoT, or it's, just a, it's a network. It's relatively easier to implement the blockchain itself, but when it comes to logistics for, say, SK and CNC, even though in theory it, it could benefit the enterprise in, in whole, as it, if it were to work, it has to collaborate with the same system with Samsung or SK or other GS retails other than that. So even though in theory they could use what we call silos, so it's a different node, they don't ha have to entirely use a same system. But even though they can benefit from using the silos, the same privacy issues come comes because it is even though a private blockchain, those who are using those blockchains can look into let's say the bookings or the administration systems through the blockchain. So even though in theory they can benefit on those blockchains, they still are not inclined to use it because maybe the cost of just reinventing the whole logistic system or just the risk of exposing what they're importing from the other countries so large, they might not use the blockchain. Okay, uh, adding to that, bringing back to that question, right? So then, considering the fact that even like you see, large logistic companies are, or you could say, are reluctant to use uh, blockchain as a form of provenance, right? Then, then how do you see those traditional logistic enterprises who will be able to adopt blockchain provenance? Um, what, how do we, how do we start? How do we create the right incentives for the market to grow? Um, maybe Hong would like to start. 
still, like I said, for SK Telecom, still it is very beneficial. And for other Duno Kakao, the Kakao corporations in Korea, they already have the Kakao Pay, Kakao Banks, and in the early stages of uh, using Kakao Bank, they, they use the Ethereum network. And also, they're not the direct uh, company, but through Dunamu, they're using the exchange called Upbit. And still, they are already benefiting from the, the aspects of blockchain. But still, I have to say, other than those like IBM or Samsung using uh, Next Ledger for those Samsung Pay, still, in my personal opinion, we have stages very much uh, not technical, but jurisdictional and business aspect of the problems to be solved. Uh, to be answered, not right now. Uh, maybe Alex would like to add as well? Uh, I just uh, uh, will add quick note. So uh, you can, uh, you know, the big corporates, they're just moving uh, not so fast. So first of all, uh, when you're talking to business people, just uh, the way to go, I think, to provide some proof of concept that build on private or even on public blockchain and you can show uh, uh, advantages of uh, such systems. Uh, and uh, again, we should always talk about problems of trust and cutting the middle, uh, middleman. Because uh, um, uh, in a lot of uh, cases, uh, uh, business people think that blockchain is kind of database, and it's wrong. Blockchain is not a database. Blockchain. Uh, uh, supposed to uh, solve problems, uh, first, first of all, problem, problems of trust. So I think the way to go is to provide proof of concept, probably some MVP, is it, and et cetera. Mm -hmm. mm. Do you have like, any specific uh, MVPs that you've seen that you say, oh, yes, this is how you should approach um, blockchain provenance? Uh, maybe any specific favorite projects uh, you'd like to add? We, we had uh, a pilot. Uh, uh, project in Russia with uh, uh, Rostrester. This is uh, a government uh, organization for uh, actually for land registration, for supply chains, etc. Uh, we uh, did a pilot project with them. It was uh, very successful, and right now, actually, it moved to production. So, but uh, again, it is huge government organization that uh, actually uh, we demonstrate a good uh, a result with our pilot, and uh, afterward it moved to a uh, delivery stage. So, Mike, mm -hmm. we like to add. How do we go from here? Well, how do we get uh, traditional logistic companies to be able to apply blockchain in Providence? Definitely, <clears throat> I think. Uh, it's a challenge and it, it varies industry to industry and you need to kind of get an understanding of the high level politics of what, what the company or enterprise's vision is. You know, in real estate, maybe uh, you want to target a company who's uh, pushing for more global or tech forward or something like that and um, giving them clear incentives of, of what they'll gain from being a, a first mover in this type of technology. So I think you need to really target the uh, specific players in the industry, and it's different for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, I can see that we've run out of time. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a bit of a summary as well. Um, so today we've discussed a little bit about blockchain use case, about especially in the context of what are the challenges that we might have, like especially in terms of privacy issues, there might be scalability issues, um, there, there might even be cost issues, especially dependent upon uh, how do we approach blockchain technology per se? Um, we've seen, um, I mean, all our panelists here have given very good use cases. They are, they are, they are from the project itself, uh, use cases about how do we apply blockchain in provenance, especially in the context of property. We've seen uh, numerous use cases of that. Um, even examples like CryptoKitties. It's a very interesting example about uh, using non-fungible tokens, and this can be act as a form of uh, provenance or origin of, of, of of something, right? Um, we also um, have discussed a little bit about in terms of application, in terms of how do we see businesses applying it? What are the market incentives? What are the challenges 
uh, for business to accept. I, I think, I, think you, uh, I hope it was an interesting discussion for you guys and something you can take home and, and reflect and maybe do a little bit of additional research about what are the other additional interesting projects we can see. Uh, I'd like to thank the panelists for today um, and see you, see you guys around. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you.